So within a rank itself, I can have what are called multiple banks. Okay, so that's the next term I'm going to introduce. So in this example, what I've shown you here is that you know in one DRAM chip, in this one orange box, which is one DRAM chip, I have you know one of these boxes which is called a bank. And in this case I've drawn the bank large enough that you know I can only accommodate two banks in one DRAM chip. Okay, typically a DRAM chip will have either four, eight, or sixteen banks. Okay, but in this case I have two banks. Each one of these banks can be accessed independently. Okay, so at a time, you know, when I make a request, that request shows up at this bank. And what I'm busy doing is reading out, you know, one row of data into another structure called the row buffer. Okay, so, you know, reading that row of data into the row buffer takes many nanoseconds. Okay, so while that bank is busy, I want the memory controller to be able to issue requests to other parts of the memory system as well. Okay, so while that one bank is busy, I can also re issue a request to this other bank and say that, you know, while the first one is busy reading data out, you can also read out a different row of data into your own row buffer. Okay, so the banks essentially provide memory level parallelism. So, you know, while one bank is busy, because that bank is going to be busy for, you know, many nanoseconds, you want to be able to issue requests to other banks at the same time. Okay, and note that you know it's not just this one DRAM chip that is going to read data out into its row buffer, right? Since all of these DRAM chips in a rank work in unison, at the same time you will have you know this DRAM chip also reading out the same row into its row buffer, you know this row into its row buffer, and so on, right? So every this entire row of data spread across many DRAM chips is all being read into its row buffer, right? And as I said, that takes say 15 nanoseconds or or 45 nanoseconds. And so in the meantime, I can also issue requests to other banks. So the more banks I have, the more more memory parallelism that I'm supporting. And that also means that in any given cycle, there's a pretty high probability that you know one of the banks has finished reading out data and is ready to send data back on the bus. Okay, so the more banks I have, the more likely that I'm going to keep my data bus busy with data transfers all the time. Okay, if I didn't have these many banks, if I only had a single bank, what it means is I can issue one request, 45 nanoseconds later I get the data and so you know your your bus will then be occupied for a few cycles but then you have these 45 nanoseconds of idle time between the bus uh, having any kind of data transfer. Okay, So the more banks I have, the more likely that I can keep the bus busy with other data transfers while one bank is busy getting data out. Okay, so we've you know we've looked at a number of different terms over here. We've looked at you know ranks, banks, row buffers, and there's essentially you know one row buffer associated with every single bank, right? And that row buffer is keeping track of the last row of data that had been serviced by that bank. Okay, so when you make a request, an entire row of data from a bank gets placed into the row buffer, and this row buffer has a pretty large size. Okay, so it can actually store eight kilobytes worth of data, or you know, or maybe four or sixteen kilobytes worth of data. And usually, the memory controller is only making a request for a 64-byte cache line. Okay, so what you're doing in this case is reading out a whole bunch of data into the row buffer, and then a small fraction of that row buffer, you know, 64 bytes worth, is then being sent back to the processor. Okay, so uh, you know, the hope is that in the near future, if the application exhibits some spatial locality, then you will also be making requests for other elements that are currently sitting in the row buffer. And if you do that, then those accesses are, are faster. Okay, so the row buffer is like a cache inside your DRAM chips. It's saying that at a time, I'm always going to keep track of the last eight kilobytes of, of data or the last row that was read from a given bank. And if you make requests to these same eight kilobytes of data, then you know those requests are serviced much sooner. Okay, so there's you know one row buffer associated with every single uh, bank. So you know in the next slide, I'm going to take a closer look at what happens inside a bank. Before I do that, I also wanted to explain, you know, one more term. So I should say that, you know, these memory channels are implemented uh, under what is called the JEDEX standard, right? So, you know, since there are these standards governing um, the access to these memory devices, it's easy for me to kind of take out a DIMM and put in another DIMM, right? So there is this plug and play functionality that are provided by these memory devices. And this is because they all confirm to a given standard, okay? Uh, I should also mention that these channels use what is called the DDR protocol uh, 
and there are many generations of DDR. So the one that we are currently using is DDR3. DDR stands for double data rate. Okay, so in an effort to boost bandwidth, these DDR protocols, you know, if you look at one cycle um, on this memory bus, you can send data on this rising edge and you can also send data on this on this falling edge. Okay, so if I'm making a request for a 64 byte cache line, that 64 byte cache line has to be sent over eight different transfers on the 64 bit bus. Okay, but those eight transfers are not going to take eight cycles. They're only going to take four cycles because I'm sending, you know, two transfers in every single cycle. There is one 64-bit burst of data going on the rising edge and one 64-bit wide data transfer happening on the falling edge. Okay, so I have to send my data back uh, in four cycles or in eight different transfers. Okay, so now as I said, you know, let me go into this bank over here and let me just kind of zero in on that bank. Okay, so in one bank, or, or let me just go back again over here. So if, if, if you look at one of these banks over here, they are themselves partitioned into, you know, multiple different boxes. Okay, and each box is called an array. In some literature, you will, call, you, you, you will see it being referred to as a subarray or a mat as well. But it's essentially, you know, one array or matrix of bits. And in this example, I have, um, I have an array which has 4,000 rows and 4,000 columns. Okay, so you know one of these arrays has a capacity of 16 megabits. So when you make a request for any piece of data, the first thing that shows up is a row address. Okay, so in this case, I need 12 bits of uh, of, of a row address to pick out one row out of these 4,096 rows. Okay, so these row address bits that show up first are called your row access strobe or your RAS signal. Okay, so once you once you once you identify a particular row, that entire row of data then gets read out. So there are 4,096 bits in this case that get read into uh, into a circuit which is called the sense amplifier. And the sense amplifier is essentially your row buffer. Okay, so what you've ended up reading over here is 4,096 bits of data into your row buffer. And then, you know, out of these many bits that you've read out, the processor only needs a small fraction, right? So, you know, out of these 4,096 bits, you might only have to send back, you know, 8 bits. And, you know, note that the processor has made a request for 64 bytes or 512 bits, but there are several arrays and several DRAM chips that are all working together to provide this data. Okay, so this particular array is responsible for only sending back, you know, 8 bits of data. And so, you not next need to send you know, 12 more address bits to pick out the start of this data, right? So out of these 4,096 bits, you had to pick out one bit, which represents the start of the data transfer. Okay, so these 12 bits show up. They are now referred to as the CAS signal or the column access strobe signal. And then from here, you send the next eight bits. Okay, so your, your address is actually being communicated across multiple transfers on the address bus. Okay, so if you go back here again, I said that you can only send 17 bits of address at a time. Okay, so you know your address is sent across you know two different address transfers. The first one to arrive identifies the row that you're interested in, and the next transfer that arrives specifies the specific few bits within your row buffer. Okay, so in this example, I have I can send two 17-bit address transfers, which gives me a 34-bit address, but you know each address is specifying a 64-byte block of data. Okay, so essentially this gives you a 40-bit uh, address space, which allows you to provide, you know, one terabyte worth of data. Okay, so we've gone through a, through a bunch of different concepts over here. I'll do a quick recap before I continue in my next video.